Well, turn with me again to the letter of 1 Corinthians, chapter 16. Uh, we have been in this letter a long time now. We are going to be wrapping up in the next couple of weeks. I think we'll have one more message after tonight, which will be two weeks from tonight. And Paul is here in this section dealing with some practical issues. He has talked about the issue of giving. We spent a couple of weeks on that. He has addressed the issue of planning. And now he's going to mention the subject of showing respect toward fellow workers in the faith. Showing respect. It is important for those of us who are in the church to show respect and appreciation to others who are serving alongside us in the Lord's work. That's what Paul is doing in this last section of 1 Corinthians 16. And as is his custom, Paul addresses several co-workers by name at the end of this letter. And since this is somewhat of a personal nature here, most people or many people just skip over this part, but we shouldn't do that because there are some important truths here that are just as much a part of inspired scripture as any other part of the word of God. Now, we're going to look at verses 10 through 12, and then we're going to jump over verses 13 and 14 because that is kind of a parenthetical thought, if you will, and then we're going to examine verses 15 through 18. We're going to come back and catch verses 13 and 14 next time. But in this section that we're focusing on tonight, we see that Paul understood the importance of team ministry. He knew that he was dependent on many others who worked alongside him in the work of the Lord. None of us, of course, is an island. All of us are dependent on one another. There are no superstars in God's work, only servants. And we need to learn to respect each other's contributions. We even need to learn to express our appreciation to one another. You can never go wrong in showing respect and appreciation for people. Well, Paul gives us three people or groups of people here that he wants the Corinthian Christians to respect and show respect for. And some of these are well-known Others are not so well known. First of all, in verses 10, through, 10 and 11, he says that we should show respect for the unassuming. For the unassuming. And here, Paul mentions his son in the faith, Timothy. Look with me again at verses 10 and 11. Now, if Timothy comes, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid, for he is doing the Lord's work, as I also am. Let no one despise him, but send him on his way in peace, so that he may come to me, for I expect him with the brethren. Timothy was probably the most well-known of the people that Paul mentions here at the end of this letter. We know quite a bit about Timothy because he was a traveling companion of Paul. He was a son in the faith as Paul had led him to the Lord and then discipled him. And now he is ministering alongside Paul in the gospel. Timothy was just a young boy probably in his late teens, when Paul came to his hometown of Lystra. And he was converted and began his 
spiritual growth under Paul's teaching and training. And by the way, this says a lot to us about the importance of discipling those who are young in the faith. It says something about the importance of training up those who will carry the baton of ministry when we are gone. Thank God for older, more mature Christians who are willing to be patient with the immaturity of young Christians and to disciple them and to help them along toward a more mature faith. That's what Paul did with Timothy. But even though Timothy had grown rapidly and was now an effective minister of the gospel, the Bible tells us he had two major problems that he needed to overcome. First of all, he was still very young. And in that culture, youth was despised while age was respected. That's why Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 4.12, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. You know, in our day and time, the young are often more highly respected than the aged. But it was not like that in those days. It is still not like that in many nations of the world today. Except for America, people seem to have a natural understanding that those who have been around longer have more experience with life and therefore should be honored for their wisdom. For some reason, we don't seem to have that perspective anymore. Well, we won't get into that debate tonight because we might be here too long. But Paul tells the Corinthians not to despise Timothy. Perhaps this has to do with Timothy's age. Because he was so young, <clears throat> he needed to set a good example to gain respect in order to be more effective in ministry. So he had to work a little harder because of his age. But of course, nothing he could do about his age until the time came that he became more mature. But Paul is telling him he needs to make sure he's an example. But Timothy also had <clears throat> another problem that also contributed to his lack of respect, and that was he apparently was somewhat shy or timid, or at least he was unassuming. Ray Stedman writes, there are some commentators who speak of Timothy as though he were a very timid young man, very much afraid to get involved because of the exhortations of the Apostle Paul to him to be a little more aggressive in his labors. Stedman says, but I do not think it was timidity so much as it was really, <coughs> it was really a temperament that was quiet and unassuming and did not force its way to the front. Now, whether he's correct or not, we don't really know. But we know that Timothy had been encouraged by Paul on numerous occasions to be more bold. So he must have, in some way, struggled with this issue, and therefore, Paul is admonishing the Corinthians to show him respect and not despise him. He says, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid. That, that's another way of saying, help to put him at ease. Receive him with a warm, loving attitude. Why is that? Because he's doing the Lord's work. Paul says, just like I am. Timothy's doing the Lord's work, so respect him for that. Paul is really saying, respect him for the work he's doing. It's the Lord's work, therefore it is 
worthy of respect. Listen, anyone that is doing the Lord's work is worthy of respect and support regardless of their temperament or personality. And notice that not only does Paul say that they should respect him, but also that they should support him. He says, send him on his way. Now, that does not mean they were to say to Timothy, Tim, get on down the road. No, that's not what he's saying here. What this means is they were to give him money, financial and material support that would allow him to continue his missionary endeavors. That's what he's talking about here. And notice they were to send him out in peace. That simply means don't hassle him. You see, there was probably a tendency to perhaps give Timothy a hard time, maybe because of his personality. We don't know all of that. But Paul says, let him go out in peace. And you know, it's interesting that people who would not have dared to confront or argue with Paul himself, maybe would at times grab a hold of Timothy and take him to task for certain viewpoints. Maybe they would argue with Timothy over doctrinal points where they would never have been brave enough to debate Paul on the same points. This was especially a concern here in Corinth because there were some there who had even resisted Paul himself. And if they had trouble with Paul, how much more would they have resisted young Timothy? So Paul is warning them against this natural tendency to be overbearing toward this young man. But he says to them, listen to him. He's, he's doing the Lord's work. He has the Lord's message. Listen to him, help him, respect him, and support him. These are things we need to do in the church today for all those who are doing the Lord's work. Show respect for the unassuming. Secondly, we need to show respect for the unwilling. For the unwilling. Look at verse 12. But concerning Apollos, our brother, I encouraged him greatly to come to you with the brethren. And it was not at all his desire to come now, but he will come when he has opportunity. This is a very interesting verse of Scripture. Here's the Apostle Paul, the great apostle to the Gentiles, the founder of most of the New Testament churches, the author of a great portion of the New Testament, and he thinks that Apollos should come to Corinth. But Apollos doesn't think he should. So what does Paul do? Does he pull rank on him? Does he order him to go? Does he badmouth him for not going? No. What does he do? He shows respect for his decision. He allows for Apollos to determine God's will for his own life and ministry. He does not berate him. He does not make him look bad in front of others. Please understand here, this was not a matter of direct revelation from God that Apollos should go. This was not a decree from God here. This is not something that God had made clear was his will. This is Paul's opinion based on his best wisdom and knowledge of the facts. He thought Apollos should go and be with them at this time. But Apollos has a different assessment. He believes 
that it is important for him to stay longer in Ephesus in Ephesus, in much the same way that Paul himself had concluded that we read about in verse 8 of this same chapter. But what I want you to see here is that Paul showed respect for his fellow worker in the faith and his right to make a decision that seemed wise to him. He didn't try to make Apollos look bad for not wanting to come there at this time. He simply said, Apollos will get here as soon as he can, as soon as he deems best. Now, let's think about the application of this for us. I think we can learn a lot here. I know I can. We need to be reminded here that when someone else does something that we do not agree with, we still need to respect them for their decision. We need to respect them. We need to give them the benefit of the doubt that they also love the Lord and they also want to do what pleases the Lord and what they believe is the best decision to make for his glory. We need to respect the decisions of others. It may not be the same decision we would make, but that does not mean we can't respect them for making it. We need to allow each other the room to pursue the will of God as best we can. And we need to understand that when it comes to a preference issue or a strategy issue, there are going to be different conclusions reached by different Christians. There's no right or wrong answer. Now, if it, of course, is a matter of being obedient to something that is clearly revealed in God's word, that's a different issue. In that case, there's only one correct response. In that case, we need to line up with what God has commanded. But when it comes to something that is not given in Scripture, then we need to allow for some differences in decisions and still respect each other for those decisions. That is what is being modeled here by the Apostle Paul. You say, well, why did Paul want Apollos to come to Corinth at this time? Well, we don't really know for sure. We can speculate. But remember now, Apollos was one of the previous pastors in Corinth. And he was one of the ones around whom certain Corinthian Christians had fostered a degree of division. There were some who were followers of Apollos. And perhaps Paul thought, well, if Apollos came, he might help diffuse some of that. On the other hand, that may have been the very reason why Apollos thought it would not be good for him to go at that time. And perhaps he thought that if he stayed away, those who were committed to following him would calm down. And we need to understand who Apollos was. Apollos was kind of a golden-tongued, eloquent preacher, and maybe he thought that things would only get worse if he went there. And so he may have thought, well, if he stayed away, they could get over him and move on. Well, whatever the case, we don't really know. What we do know is that Paul did not lord it over Apollos and order him to go there like some general might. He urged him to go, but when he decided otherwise, he respected that decision Well, there's one more group of people that we need to see here in this passage. In verses 15 through 18, 
Paul talks about the household of Stephanus and a few others. And here we see that we should show respect for the untiring. Show respect for the untiring. Let's read this whole section and then we'll come back and break it down a little bit. Paul says, now I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints, that you also be in subjection to such men and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have supplied what was lacking on your part, for they have refreshed my spirit in yours, therefore acknowledge such men. Now, there are four things that we see in this section. First of all, we need to see the first fruit of salvation. The first fruit of salvation. Notice the first part of verse 15. Now, I urge you, the brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that they were, notice, the first fruits of Achaia. Achaia is a reference to the Peloponnesian Peninsula, which is the lower part of ancient Greece. And you may remember that Paul had that vision from a man in Macedonia pleading with him to come into that part of the world. And of course, then he, he went there. From there, he went into northern Greece and then on into southern Greece where Athens was located and eventually he got to Corinth. And Paul is saying here that Stephanus was the first convert in this region known as Achaia. Now this means that Stephanus was probably originally from Athens because this is where Paul went first when he went to this region. And Acts chapter 17 tells us that he preached that great sermon on Mars Hill there in Athens, and the Bible tells us there were some who believed. He even tells us the names of some of those who believed. And if Stephanus was the first fruit, that means he was the first Christian convert in Achaia. That tells us he would have had to have been in Athens when Paul got there. At any rate, he's now in Corinth. And we're told in chapter 1 of this letter that Stephanus was one of the few individuals that Paul had personally baptized. He must have been special to Paul because he was the first fruits of that entire region. <clears throat> but the main thing that we need to see here is that he was only the first of many others to come. Now, we already know that the first, first fruits in Scripture are all about offering that which comes first. It, it, it has to do with uh, trusting God. When we offer the first fruits of the crop, for example, we're trusting God that the rest of the crop will be just as good as the first fruits. So this was an offering that was given to God. This is used figuratively here in reference to Stephanus. And although Stephanus was the first one to be saved in Achaia, many others would quickly follow, including that of his entire household, which would have included not only his family, but his servants as well. And the believers to which Paul is now writing in Corinth are also part of that harvest that would follow in like kind with the first fruits. This should be a reminder to us of the importance of evangelism in the life of the church. That is to be our heartbeat. 
everything that we do should be an effort to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to be reminded that when one person comes to Christ, many others may also come to Christ in their family or in their circle of influence. And so we see that Paul here is in a way reminiscing. He's thanking God for this one who was the first one to come to know Christ in Achaia. But there's something else that we see Paul is thankful for in regard to Stephanus. Secondly, we see the fervency of his service. The fervency of his service. Notice the last half of verse 15. And that they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints. Now, there's a very interesting word here that tells us Stephanus had a problem. He was an addict. Stephanus was an addict. The word for devoted there is a word that can mean addicted. It can mean addicted. Get this. Stephanus and the others there in Corinth were addicted to ministry. They were devoted to ministry. I can relate to that. He was literally addicted to serving the needs of the saints. He was hooked on hospitality. He was in bondage to the beloved. And listen, that should be the case for us as well. Every single one of us who names the name of Christ should be addicted to ministry in the body of Christ. Devoted really is too mild a word here. Addicted is the word we should use. Someone who is addicted to something means that that is all they think about. It's always on their mind. It means that this is just the habit of their life. It means that they thrive on it, that this is their top priority. You say, how did Stephanus get this addiction? Well, he got it because he was first hooked on Jesus Christ. He was absolutely devoted to Jesus Christ. And when he became devoted to Christ, the ministry of Christ's body just came naturally. You see, my friend, when you get hooked on Jesus, you're going to get hooked on serving those whom he loves. You're going to naturally become devoted to serving the saints. That should just be second nature to us. And you know, to many of us, the church is really the passion of life. All our social relationships are right here. All our friendships are here. All our priorities are here, and that's the way it ought to be. This is, this is more than just a family. This is a spiritual family. This is even closer than a natural family. And you know, my church family is closer to me than my nearest kin. That's how it should be. Now, of course, that's not to say that we should not be relating to the lost and trying to win them for Christ, but our primarily, our primary relationships are to be in the church. We're to be devoted to ministering to the saints. And notice that it says they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints. That means they have volunteered. They volunteered. They were not coerced. They were not recruited. In fact, they didn't even wait for someone to come and ask them to serve. They just jumped right in and they began serving the needs of the saints wherever they saw them. And you know, sometimes it's necessary for the church to appoint certain people like deacons and elders, but most of the time, what is needed is for Christians to simply find a need and meet it. 
just, just jump into ministry and just serve. You don't have to have a title. You don't have to have a position. Just get in there and roll up your sleeves and go to work serving the saints. That's what Stephanus and his household did. <clears throat> and then we see the fulfillment of submission. Paul says in verse 16 that you also be in subjection to such men and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. God expects us to be submissive to those who lead in the things of the Lord. This is the clear teaching of Scripture. Anyone who is involved in doing the work of the Lord should be respected. They should be submitted to in the sense that they are representing the Lord himself. And of course, the Bible has a lot to say about our mutual submission to one another and our submission to those who lead in the church. And I'm not going to take the time tonight to develop all that, but it is clearly taught in Scripture, as you know. But Paul tells the Corinthians here to submit to these who are such a godly example to them. Submit to their leadership. And then lastly, we see the freshness of support. Look at verse 17. <clears throat> I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have supplied what was lacking on your part, for they have refreshed my spirit in yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. Here Paul adds a couple more names. <clears throat> he says that these men have been such a blessing, not only to him personally, but to the Corinthians as well. And he says, these men have refreshed my spirit. Do you know Christians like that? Do you know brothers and sisters in the Lord that are just a joy to be around and they refresh you every time you are around them? That's what Paul said of these men. That's the way it ought to be with all of us, really. We ought to be a constant source of refreshment in how we encourage and support one another. So Paul is speaking here specifically of those who support the saints and the church leaders, and we don't really know in what way they supplied what was lacking on the part of the Corinthians here. Perhaps it was monetary support. Perhaps it was the support of using their spiritual gifts to build them up in the faith. We don't really know what it was. Whatever it was, their support was a joy and a source of refreshment. And as I read this account, my mind just goes to people in this body that are like that to me. They are so supportive that they are a constant source of encouragement to me. And I know you can think of people like that as well. Praise God for them. But you know what? It also motivates me to be that way for others. I need to be like that. I need to be the kind of person that other Christians look forward to being around. I need to be one who is refreshing to other believers. And then notice what Paul says in that last sentence. Therefore, acknowledge such men. That means to appreciate them. It means to let them know you appreciate them. Thank them for the way they encourage you. Honor them as godly examples. Now, this doesn't mean we have to put up a plaque in their honor or erect a statue to them in the foyer. It just means we express appreciation for them any way we can. And I think most of us need to do more of that. So this is the message we find at the end of this book. It is one we need to hear, and it's one we need to heed. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would help us to grasp the significance of 
what Paul is doing here. And Lord, that we also might be those who are encouragers, that we also might be those who are devoted to ministry to the saints. Lord, that we might be those who also are respectful and those who show appreciation and those who uh, support financially has been mentioned in this chapter and help us to be the kind of believers that are examples to others. Help us to have that kind of body dynamic here in this body of believers. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen.